All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I can't quite see. It's hard for me to tell who all is here, but whoever is here, welcome. And more people join as we go. Um, we're here today to talk about orthobiologics for sport injuries. And so I'll explain what that means. And it's not going to be just about sports because we're going to talk about that good old arthritis that lots and lots of people come to me for as well. But a lot of times that's the end result of some type of injury, especially a sports injury. Um, and so just to give you a little background, uh, I moved to Tahoe a couple years ago. I think my doors have been open here to see all you lovely patients for about a year and a half now, just a little over. Um, but I come from Philadelphia area and I have a background in physical medicine and rehabilitation with a specialty in sports medicine. And so you can think of it as uh, like non-operative sports medicine. My goal is to try and find ways to help you avoid surgery, to help you reach your goals, uh, to help you get back out there um, with less pain and better function. Um, so that's what I am here to do. And what a can't be a better place than Tahoe to do that. Cause I know everybody here is super active. Um, I trained at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and then I went to Temple. And um, I also, so the osteo, PCOM is an osteopathic school, so I'm a DO. And I love that I had that training because some of the, the main core principles of being an osteopath is that the body has the ability to heal itself um, and that structure and function are interrelated. And so a lot of what I do in medicine really plays on those core principles. And um, then in terms of what we're talking about today, um, I have been doing this type of treatment, I, I hate to say it for how long I've been doing it, but over 12 years now, I think even 13 or 14 years now. So I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I was very fortunate in my residency um, to have it just up and coming as I was in residency. So I was very fortunate to kind of be on the early end, one of the kind of the, the frontiers of being trained in this uh, type of medicine. So what is orthobiologics? And you'll see lots of terms out there for it, um, but we call it stem cell, but I can't really say that word because FDA doesn't like it. So we're not gonna say that word anymore. Um, we call it regenerative medicine. And what we're trying to do is just use your body's own innate healing factors um, in order to augment an injury or help something that's not healing on its own. Um, and why we do this is because even though we, I just stated that the body has the ability to heal itself, um, sometimes that, that process gets interrupted, interfered with, doesn't, doesn't work the way we want it to but we have the ability in our body, we just need to find a way to get it there. And that's basically what we're doing. We're taking substances from somewhere in your body and, and transferring them to where you need that injury to heal. And so that is gonna help assist and speed that healing process. Um, and again, I know Natasha said it, but as people come on, feel free to ask questions either in the chat and the, or the Q and A. And Natasha will go ahead and um, present those at the end. Uh, and then, um, of course, also, if you're one of my patients or people who have had this and you want to just give your experience, good or bad, please chime in so that people can hear um, how you've done with it. So what do we what do we use this for in sports medicine? Um, so mainly, mainly we use it for tendon and joint problems. That is kind of the crux of what I do. Um, so tendon injuries arthritis, meniscal problems, things, label tears, those, that's kind of 90-ish percent of what we use this for. Um, we also use it for ligament injuries. Um, well, some people will use it for fracture, although I tend not to, just a few times I have. Uh, we use it for muscle injuries, although it's rare to need it for muscle injuries because most of the time your muscles are very vascular or have a lot of blood flow to them, so we don't need to use um, your body's healing factors because your body already does it on its own. Um, sometimes we're using it to either prevent surgery or delay surgery. And that's one of our big goals. Can we do that? Sometimes we, oh, sorry. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. So, but that's what I'm trying to figure out with you. Um, and also we'll use it to augment surgery. And so surgeons will use it in the OR intraoperatively 
or sometimes we'll use it postoperatively to help augment your surgical repair or whatever you had done. Uh, and this Achilles is my Achilles heel right now. So I'm gonna, I already did my own PRP to it. <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to present this slide. This slide shows um, the healing cascade once an injury has happened. And I wanted to show you this for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, I wanted to give an understanding of why we say you need to wait to get back into sports. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but um, here kind of where I'm circling, there's this, there's these things called fibroblasts and they're what come in early on. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and I also wanted to show this slide to give you an understanding of why we make you wait to get back into things after we do these procedures, because we don't wanna break down the healing process that we're trying to induce. And so basically you have an injury and the very right away we release platelets that creates our blood clot that starts the healing cascade right away. We get inflammation and that inflammation is good in the beginning. We need that inflammation. It brings in the healing that we need that lasts one to two weeks and in that inflammatory phase, obviously you're feeling the soreness, the discomfort, you're seeing the swelling, the bruising, those types of things. Um, but in that inflammation phase, that's where the fibroblasts. So as we, that little uh, red oval that I just popped up there, those help initially, but unfortunately they are not what we need for long-term healing. So these, this is what can start to bring in scar tissue. We need a little bit of that, but we actually want good collagen tissue. So after you know a week or two, we actually get what's called the proliferation phase. And the proliferation phase is where we actually start to create the new tissue, lay the foundations and, and lay the network. Um, but as you can see, we're just starting to get some collagen formation in this, in this phase. And that can last you know, upwards of a month, maybe even two months. But then after that, we go into a remodeling phase. And if that green like uh, area that you see there, that can take, you can see up to a hundred days, that can take up to a year. So we want our body to heal super fast, but it's actually a slower process than we think. And we really want that collagen to come in because that's what's actually inducing healing in our ligaments and our tendons and our joints. And so this is where sometimes we can make a mistake when we're um, getting back from an injury and we try and get back in the early phases and our body's just not ready for it. It actually halts the healing process and then we don't make that collagen and then we get stuck with scar tissue instead. And that is what this slide talks about a little bit. So what causes of abnormal healing, which I just mentioned was trying to get back too soon after an injury. Um, repetitive forces can do it as well. So if we're doing the same thing over and over again, just like you, know, you can get carpal tunnel, um, which is nerve damage in your wrist from repetitive overuse, from typing, using a jackhammer, um, lots and lots of mountain biking and rattling of those wrists, same concept there. Um, just repetitive forces and constant overuse can, can really wear down tendons, can create probably muscle imbalances, um, and that can contribute to the abnormal healing. Overuse is another big one. Um, that's probably the biggest one that we see. So my motto is uh, too much, too fast, too soon. And if we fall into that category of just going at too fast, going at too hard, um, too soon, then we really set the stage for us to, for the, if we get injured for it not to heal. Steroids definitely play a role. They can contribute to uh, injury and non-healing. That's why I have this picture of Ryan Howard up again, Philly's girl. Um, this, was, this was an interesting article saying the most devastating play in Philadelphia sports history because the Phillies were a dynasty back in the mid-2000s, 2008, 9, 10, 11. And Ryan Howard tore his Achilles in 2011 from overuse and from frequent steroid injections to keep him playing. And so he's a perfect example of, you know, this was abnormal healing that we didn't allow the time. We actually induced forces that caused the injury. Um, and then fluoroquinolones, which is an antibiotic, are, are uh, odd. People are surprised when they see that, but 
that is something that can also contribute to abnormal tendon healing, um, trauma, obviously. So those are extrinsic factors. And then with, below that, we have our intrinsic factors, meaning like, what's happening inside us, what's going on, what is happening with our biomechanics, our running form, our shoe wear, you know, our hips shifting, things like that, things that we actually prescribe a lot of physical therapy for to help figure those things out and address those things. Um, advancing age, unfortunately, you know, our, as, a, as we age, we get less blood flow to our tendons, we get less blood flow to our joint, to our meniscus, um, and without blood flow, we can't bring in healing. Um, same thing with health level and poor blood flow. So things like smoking, poor health, not taking care of yourself, poor diet, will contribute to abnormal healing 100%. Um, so uh, this is just one cascade of abnormal healing. And I want to point this one out because this is very related to what we do when we're treating arthritis in joints. Um, and so let's say you get a joint injury over here on the left with this red arrow. What happens is, just like any injury, you get the acute inflammatory phase. So you twist the knee, maybe you tear your meniscus, but it's not bad. Um, but you still get inflammation. And there's two ways this can go. This can go towards resolution of that inflammation, um, or it can go towards perpetuation of the inflammation. And so at the top, when we see perpetuation of that inflammation, that's usually because either it's a really bad injury, or we keep repeating the injury, or we're not giving ourselves enough time to heal. And then what happens is our body goes into a little bit of like a negative feedback loop, and we continue to create what's called cytokines and chemokines and tumor necrosis factors. These are things that cause joint destruction. So instead of healing, you actually progress to that PTOA stands for post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Um, so we, what we want to avoid is that progression, the post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And sometimes we can do all the things right, and we still have these chemical mediators in there that are sending the signal towards uh, joint destruction. And so what we want is here is we want to answer this big question mark of how do we get down here to the resolution of inflammation. And we've identified a couple of very important markers in our body that can really help with that. Um, these two IL-10 and IL-1RA, uh, they're fancy um, receptor activator proteins that actually uh, reverse the chemical balance and can slow the progression of the arthritis or even stop it if it's a post-traumatic arthritis. And those are present in our body's bone marrow. And so that's why I really wanted to point this slide out to you because I think it's fun. And I think if you kind of want to nerd out on the science of it, this is perfect slide. Um, and then last kind of geeky slide, um, this is orthobiologics under the microscope. Basically, this is PRP or platelet-rich plasma. And this is just showing you the fun, good healing factors that are present other than what I just showed you that's in bone marrow. And so these are called growth factors. And these growth factors um, stimulate blood flow. They stimulate cell tissue proliferation. They stimulate long-term healing. And so that's why we want to harvest these and put them in the area where you had an injury. Uh, so, and I hope I'm not going too fast. And again, if I see a couple more people joining in, so if you have questions, um, feel free to put it in the chat or the Q and A. I would love to hear from you. Um, all right, so let's talk about what uh, I do here. There's other things out there, and if you have questions about that, I'm knowledgeable on it, and I can tell you why I do or don't do it. Um, but PRP is platelet-rich plasma, and basically we draw your own concentrated platelets from your own blood. I just take it straight from your arm. It's done here in the office. It's a simple blood draw. Um, it's not really any more blood than you, it's definitely way less than you would get for a blood transfusion or um, donating blood. Um, just depends on what we're doing and how we're doing it. So it can range anymore from a couple vials, small vials to you know, a little bit less than a blood uh, donation. Um, so it's certainly very manageable. And they, the PRP that we're taking, then I take it and I process it um, through a centrifuge and we, and we concentrate down those healing factors that, I, that were on the last screen. And, um, and then that we're gonna use that to inject that into the area of injury. 
It's really well tolerated. It can vary in terms of discomfort in terms of getting the injection done. Um, typically for arthritis pain, it's very well tolerated. Tendons can vary dramatically. Some tendons hurt more than others. And so we would have that discussion together about, hey, what's the likelihood this is gonna be painful? And typically the worst pain is in the first 10 to 30 minutes. And again, if any of my guys and gals are here that have had this done, go ahead and let, let people know what your result was, how long you were in pain, how bad your pain was. Um, I've had people be like, oh, that was it? Like, I thought it was gonna be worse than that and hop off the table and go. And then I've had people have to sit and hang out and put some warm heat on it and then it passes in 20 or 30 minutes. But I do know that, um, that uh, you know, people hear a lot out in the community that, oh, it hurts and it does create a fear about getting it done. Um, and I can talk you through that and I can help give you an idea of what you can expect based on your injury and, and what type of product I would be using. Um, and there are different products out there. So again, it, it just depends on your type of injury, what our goal is, what we're looking to do. So I can change the platelet-rich plasma to be different types so that we can tailor it to exactly what you need. Um, so that's platelet-rich plasma. Let's talk about bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Um, this is when we take your healing factors directly from your bone marrow. Typically, we go through your iliac crest, or which is the pelvic bone from the back. Um, I know people here taking bone marrow out and they immediately cringe. Almost everybody cringes as soon as they hear where, that I'm going to take bone marrow out from them. Um, and I assure them that it's not that bad. I use lots of numbing medicine. If you feel pain, I stop and I put more numbing medicine in. So I've never had anybody complain that they felt it was too painful or would never do the procedure again because of that. They, it's very well tolerated. And then in terms of recovering from the soreness from getting the um, bone marrow aspirated, it just takes uh, three to five days. It's really just kind of sore, like it kind of fell and had a little soreness there. It's not bad at all. Um, typically, this is done as just a one-time injection. Um, and again, we use it for various things, mostly arthritis, but I will use it for tendon problems as well. And it's a little bit different from PRP because we're, there's it has different healing factors and growth factors. So your blood has one thing and your in your um your stem or your bone marrow has another thing. And so depending on what we're trying to do, we may access one or both. Um, but what what your bone marrow has that your bloodstream doesn't have nearly as much of are the regenerative cells called these mesenchymal cells, MSC. And I'm not going to say what the S stands for, so I'm going to change it to mesenchymal stromal cells. Um, be, so what mesenchymal stromal cells are is their precursor cells. Those are cells that when you put them, when you take them from your bone marrow and you put them somewhere else in the body, they get a signal from that part of the body to uh, differentiate or turn into something else. So if we put it in the knee, we can create new cartilage. If we put it in the tendon, we can create new tenocytes, which is tendon cells. Um, and so that is the hallmark of what the bone marrow is trying to do. Uh, we have some studies showing that it's superior to PRP for knee arthritis. It's a little bit more mixed whether or not it's better for a tendon to get PRP or bone marrow. Um, and we have some studies that show that the combination of the bone marrow and the PRP from your blood actually work really well together um, synergistically. So I often will recommend a combination of those. Um, and for this, you know, our goal for tendons is to heal the tendon. Our goal for arthritis is to calm down the inflammation, decrease the pain, improve function, try and buy you a few years of really good time. Um, and this is a question I get all the time is, can I, is what I'm doing slowing down or even reversing arthritis? And we don't have the exact answer to that yet. There's some evidence that shows that we might be slowing down the arthritis. There's some evidence that shows we're, we're growing cartilage. Um, we have pre and post MRIs showing less cartilage than more cartilage. 
um, after you've had the after you've had the bone marrow injection. But we don't know how meaningful it is. We don't have studies to show if we actually were able to stop you from getting a knee replacement or something along those lines. Right now, what I tell people is I'm slowing. My goal is to slow your need for a replacement when we're talking about arthritis. I'm trying to buy you time, and, you know, and I've been doing this for, again, longer than I want to say. Um, and I, I anecdotally, not based on the studies, but based on my results, I can tell you that I'm, I'm buying some time for you, typically to hopefully three or four or five years um, for most patients. But again, it, it is dependent on the, the situation. Um, so let's talk about what that means, um, what that situation means. So are you a candidate for orthobiologics? And there are lots of factors involved. Um, it depends on what the injury is, how old the injury is, severity of injury plays a pretty large role. Um, patient age does come into play. Sorry, I hate to say that because I know everybody here in Tahoe is 30 years younger than everybody else out there. Um, and because they stay so active and healthy and I do keep that in mind. So I, there's not hard numbers for age. Um, because people out here are so healthy and which is good. But um, we do find that our healing factors start to diminish as we age. And so we have that. That's a discussion I would have with you um, if you were interested in pursuing this. We also look at your overall health and your diet. Those are important. I usually do recommend some diet recommendation or diet changes um, leading into getting your orthobiologics. Um, and then uh, the two biggest factors that I put in capitals um, and italics. Uh, number one, goals. What, what, are you, what is your goal? What is your individual goal? What are you trying to get from this procedure? Um, I have some people who you know, have bad rotator cuff tendonitis and they maybe just wanna be able to do some basic yard work and reach up above and not have pain when they're getting stuff out of the cabinets. Um, be able to sleep at night without having to roll over a hundred times. And then I have people who want to, you know, play competitive tennis or uh, make it to a D1 baseball team. And so we have to align what your goals are um, with what we're doing. And, and so that is going to be a big factor is whether or not you're a candidate and based on all the above factors, um, then we talk, you know, what is your goal? And I tell you what the realistic expectations of reaching your goal are. Um, and sometimes we can talk about goal modification as well. Um, I have a lovely patient who had this awesome goal of being to, being able to do pull-ups. She wanted to fix her shoulder so she could do pull-ups in her, she's in her late fifties. And, um, and I asked her how many, you know, when was the last time she was able to do pull-ups and she had said never. It's just a goal she always had in her life. So, you know, we talked about just reorienting goals. And if that's the only goal she has, maybe that's not something we want to strive towards. But she actually changed her goals and said, no, I don't really need to do that. It just kind of was a fun thing I wanted to do. Um, but so sometimes we restructure goals um, or sometimes we say, OK, realistically, you know, this goal might not be something we can get to. I just want to make you aware of that. Or hopefully, yes, we can get you there. You gonna take some work, but we can do it. Which is the next topic under goals is willingness to follow the protocol because there is some stuff you have to do. We have to avoid anti-inflammatory medications. We have to change our diet a little bit. Um, we have to follow the post-procedure uh, protocols, which is which I say protocol, but it's very individualized. I do it person by person. Um, so uh, there is some downtime typically, depends on the situation. Sometimes it's as little as a week, sometimes it's three to six weeks. Uh, so it just depends on where you're at, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish, um, and how long you need to recover. And the hardest thing for me to do is hold my patients slash athletes down. They want to keep going, and I totally get that and love that, um, but I, I need you to follow the recommendations afterwards. Otherwise, if we go back to that slide I was showing you early on about inflammation and proliferation phase of healing, if we don't allow that to happen in that time frame, then you're just gonna break down all the good work that we had started. So those are huge in terms of 
um, you know, being a candidate and hoping for a good outcome. And then there's other things that if you just kind of nerd out on the studies at the bottom, you know, we're starting to finally be able to fine tune who's a good candidate and who's not a good candidate. What are some variables that we can actually identify? Because what we do find is it was very hard for us to figure out why some people would respond and some people wouldn't. And now that we've been doing this a little bit longer, we're finally starting to get some ideas of, okay, well, it didn't work for this person because of this. And now, so we start to pay attention to that. So we're getting better and better and better. And this field, I have to say, is exploding. It is a constant work for me to keep up on all the studies that are coming out, which is great because that means we're going to have progress and more options for you in the future. Um, so um, this kind of segues into what that last slide was about. So, you know, am I a candidate? And if I am, what kind of outcome can I expect? You know, what, what can I see happen? And again, that's, you know, very hard for me to answer unless I see you individually and, and figure out um, exactly what your injury is, how bad it is, all those things, what your goals are. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into play with that. But in general, and then this is very generalized, very generalized. Um, we probably aren't going to be this person at the bottom of the screen. So, but um, for tendons and ligaments, we're really looking for long-term relief. Um, and we're looking for really good relief. I mean, 60% I put as a low ball. Most of the time, I'm looking for 80 to 90, 95% uh, relief of pain and return of your function and activity and your goals. Um, for joints, if it's arthritis, same thing. We're looking at, you know, uh, somewhere between 60 to 95 percent relief. And but that usually because with arthritis isn't quite as long term. So we're hoping for one to five years, depending on what we decide to do. And again, how bad your arthritis is and things like that. And so this is, you know, it's hard for, I know this is probably one of the biggest questions people have, and it's really hard for me to give you a solid answer because it's really very individualized, um, which is why if you are interested, just come talk to me and we can have a conversation and I can go through your images and your history and do an exam and let you know, uh, give you a good honest opinion of what I think. Um, I also recommend that you, talk to somebody else, get another opinion, um, see what somebody else has to say uh, that does this uh, procedure and just get the vibe of what could work for you um, and what you feel feels best. I will caution, there's a lot of gimmicks out there. So um, just be careful who you choose. Uh, if they're putting a big ad up um, saying, you know, come to our seminar and if you sign up today, we'll give you 30% off. Um, that's probably not a good sign. Um, so just be cautious of, you know, who, who is doing it? What, what are their certifications? Are they a physician? Um, and is it something that is a mill and this is all they do and then they send you back out the door or are they really coordinating your whole care? Are they doing, are they coordinating your recovery time? Are they working with the physical therapist? Are they doing all that work? And if they are perfect, you know, hear from them, get a couple, get a second opinion so that you have um, an idea of what you want to do. Um, and again, just like I said, the science is rapidly progressing. So, key, so you know, I do these um, webinars and I'll continue to do them because uh, if I do one in six months or a year, I might be giving you completely different information. Uh, maybe not completely different, but at least more tidbits or another uh, option that's available. We do have something called amniotic membrane where we um, take it from the amniotic membrane of a fetus after delivery and inject that product. And of course, you know, babies have superior healing factors and that was available on the market previously. And I was doing it for a couple of years and then I got taken off because of FDA got really worried um, that we were gonna clone something or something. I don't think. So it got pulled off, um, not because of safety issues, just because of regulation issues. Um, and I think it's gonna come back down the pipeline. So that's something that I'm keeping a close eye on is when that comes to return. Um, and then we, we also have gene modification coming down the pipeline. Um, good places to keep an eye on the research if you're interested and just kind of following it, um, even 
either because you just think it's cool or because you're interested for yourself or maybe a grandchild. Um, good resources are places like the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic. They have good information, up-to-date information, and the Mayo Clinic is pretty much in the lead in terms of the studies that are uh, out there right now for this uh, regenerative medicine. Um, so yes, the science is progressing. We're figuring out all these uses and treatments and new treatments coming. And so just stay tuned and um, keep an eye on it because something might pop up that wasn't available that could help you for sure. Um, so thank you for listening to me chat. Uh, I love this topic because I love doing this. Um, it helps so many people. I'm devastated when it doesn't help somebody because unfortunately it's not a guaranteed result. It's very different in, for everybody. Typically, for the most part, you know, we're looking um, at 80 to 90% success rates for people. Those odds can change if you have worse, you know, worsening symptoms or, or if you're let's say it's very severe arthritis versus mild arthritis. Um, so, you know, I'm really realistic about, okay, well, if this is your arthritis, this is your likelihood of, of success. And so unfortunately, it's not a slam dunk, just like anything in medicine isn't a slam dunk. And so, um, but when we have uh, the vast majority of people have success, it just makes me super happy. Uh, so that's my chat. If anybody has any questions, I think I see some in the Q&A. So we'll let Natasha take over from here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've already gotten a couple of questions. So thank you so much. That was wonderful. If you do have questions and you missed the beginning, you are welcome to ask them in the Q&A box or the chat box um, located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and if you want to raise your hand and share an experience, we can try that too. I can um, unmute you and you can try that as well. Um, the first question I just wanted to bring up, I brought it up right before we started, but um, it's a question about having peripheral neuropathy and to drop feet. And I'm wondering if regenerative medicine can help with that in any way. Yeah, unfortunately, I wish I could say yes, but no, we are just not there for nerve regeneration. So peripheral neuropathy is a problem of the nerve um, and the drop foot is most likely a result of that because with the nerve damage, it's not sending the right signal to the muscle and the muscle can't pick the foot up. It's a very common problem. And I do get asked this question frequently. We're not there yet. And I say yet because, um, you know, the science again is evolving and evolving. So for that, I do encourage you to, to go to government clinical trials and type in PRP, type in BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, um, type in amniotic membrane and, um, and peripheral neuropathy and see if there's any studies ongoing and see maybe if even you could be a candidate for the study because there's a lot of studies out and they're constantly recruiting um, people to try and join these studies. Great. Uh, the next question is, my understanding is that the injections you were talking about will not heal a medial meniscus tear, but are just for pain management. Is that correct? Great question. Uh, for the most part, typically once torn, always torn. So the question of heal is uh, kind of a, a uh, kind of the gray zone, um, where our goal is, again, yes, to decrease pain, decrease those chemical mediators that are causing joint destruction, and reverse those to chemical mediators that are allowing for um, healing. And I have had um, some uh, circumstances with my patients, and we have some studies that do show that there can be some degree of healing, especially if it is a small tear. Um, there's a lot of type of meniscus tears, and what we found is a, a good chunk of them do not need surgery. Um, there's certain types of tears where you show me that tear, and I'm not going to offer you any type of orthobiologic. I'm just going to send you to my partner surgeons um, and say, I'm sorry, but this type of tear needs surgery. Um, but a good chunk of them do not need surgery, and that's where we can use orthobiologics. Um, and 
sometimes we can actually heal a tear or sometimes we're just giving us, you know, one, two, three, four, five years. Um, I have meniscus tears in both my meniscus on both knees, I have meniscus on both knees and over 15 years now and um, still going strong without surgery. And of course I'm just one person, but um, yeah, a tear does not necessarily equate to the need for surgery with the orthobiologics, with the right physical therapy program, with um, the right assessment of biomechanics, a lot of times we can address that tear without needing to go down the surgical road. Great. The next question is, what are the general diet changes you request for orthobiologic candidates? Good question as well. So um, this is relatively new information. Um, I just added it to my list of um, your to-dos before coming in for orthobiologics not that long ago. Um, and it was kind of based on, of course, I'm always staying up on the research and I had just kind of done a new updated research. Um, so I could, cause I was doing my own treatment on myself and um, found some interesting studies kind of dug into deep nutrition um, uh, journals and stuff. Um, but just think a clean diet. The two biggest things are um, trans fats. So anything that goes into a deep fryer um, they actually have a very good study. They took um, they took PRP and they they took it from people who they had them eat a certain amount like French fries and stuff every day. Um, and then they had people do a clean diet and they compared the PRP product and the people with the clean diet, it was far superior when you did not have that trans fat in your system. And the people who had the trans fat in the system, they actually took their blood and, and got the PRP every single week. And it took four weeks of not having that, that trans fat in order to get it out of their system. So for a month before you have any type of orthobiologics, I recommend not eating anything that goes into a deep fryer or is fried. Um, the other thing is gluten has been shown um, to have negative pro-inflammatory effects. Um, so the orthobiologics, I always say, is pro-inflammatory. We want to bring in inflammation, but there's good inflammation and bad inflammation. And, and we want the good inflammation, and gluten tends to bring in bad inflammation. And so those are the two big ones. Um, other than that, there's a suggestion about dairy, but it's not really proven. So that's kind of a, if you want to, and it's easy for you type of thing. But um, just think um, gluten and um, trans fats. Great. There's um, several questions that are kind of specific, specific, so I'll try to go through those. Um, the first one is, can you get arthritis and a knee replacement, which hurts after seven years from surgery? Uh, you can get pain after a knee replacement, um, not arthritis if you've had a full joint replacement, because a full joint replacement would mean they removed all the areas that could be arthritic. There's something called a partial knee replacement, if you if there if you've had a partial knee replacement, then that's usually one of the three compartments. Uh, if we're talking about the knee, um, and that partial knee replacement can progress to arthritis in the two compartments that didn't have the replacement, and that can be painful. But typically, if you have pain after a total knee replacement, we look we need to look for other causes besides arthritis. The next question is um, simply: Do you treat hands? Yes. <laughs> often, hmm. quite often. Okay. Um, and there's a couple of questions asking about age range. Um, the first, I'll just ask both of them and you can answer them. The first one is, is 75 too old for goal of being able to change a bulb again with a bad shoulder? Um, and then let's see, there was another one, but now I've lost it. Oh, is there a generally an upper age limit to BMAC? Okay. Uh, both great questions. Um, and we, we have some studies. Um, the, the studies, unfortunately, really focus on the knee. Um, it's just easy in science to, to do studies, controlled studies on knees. And so in terms of extrapolating to shoulders and hips and hands and ankles and everything else, you know, we extrapolate that the data is probably very similar, but I just want you to keep that in mind that the, the data I'm going to be talking about is based on knees. Um, and so what the studies show is that um, above the age of about 75 to 85 in that range, the likelihood of success does start to diminish for either PRP or bone marrow. 
Um, but we've also found that if we if we divide that population of, of controls or subjects into two categories, and again, this is just the knee, into how the knee angles. And so when you get arthritis, uh, one a lot of times a joint space collapses and it causes angling of the knee. And if you divide them into two groups and you look at the group of people who don't have a significant increased knee angle versus the people who um, do have a significant increased knee angle from the collapse of the joint, if your knee angle is okay, you actually still do just as good as somebody who's 50, um, which is great news. So it gives us a little bit of data to work with and, and ideas of, okay, we need to consider the structure uh, or morphology or structure of the joint, not just how bad the arthritis is. Um, and then there's also things we can do to increase the concentration of either the platelets or the bone marrow um, in order to get a superior response. And so we have a age related, basically by the decade, 45 to 55, 55 to 65 and so on, kind of general concept of what concentration we should be using to still get a similar response. Um, but in general, um, to, to 75 is not too old to be able to screw light bulb on, definitely not. It just depends on what your imaging looks like. Um, but that's something I can definitely help with um, as if once we see your imaging and see if that's something we can work with. Uh, but age alone is not the deciding factor of that. Great. Um, the next question is, um, the goal of BMAC is three years of pain relief. Can the inject injection be repeated when the effectiveness wears off? Absolutely. If you get three years and you were satisfied, we could do it again. Um, and it depends again on the situation. Uh, sometimes I will supplement or adjunct with what's called visco supplement, which is also hyaluronic acid. Um, sometimes we'll booster it with PRP because it just needs a little boost to reactivate again. Um, so we don't always have to go straight to the big, the big bone marrow where we have to take it and go into your bone marrow and it's more expensive. So we work with you, but any of those can be repeated. I do like to see, I don't repeat it if you did not get success. So if you come in and you say, I had this, if you think if you give me a double dose, will it work better? And the answer to that is likely no. And it's not, it's just a waste of your time and money to do that. So typically if you've had a response and you're really satisfied with it and it's been a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and you come back and you're like, oh, it was great. It's just starting to wear off. Then we can do something and we can talk together about what that is. Great. Um, there's a question, a follow-up question about the diet. You talked about no trans fat. What about using an air fryer? That was, somebody just asked me that question and, you know, I had to think about it, but there's, there's, yeah, there's no, it's, it's air fried. There's no fat. There's no, um, you're not using oil. So you're cool with an air fryer. Okay. And then we're getting several questions. I didn't want to, uh, ignore these. I just wanted to group them together just around cost, um, and insurance coverage. Um, and there was a specific question about Medicare, if Medicare covers it, I don't know all of what you can address with that. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the financial component of things. Um, it is generally in general, not covered by any insurance, uh, including Medicare. Um, on, on some occasions we can get it covered by workman's comp. Um, they're starting to see the value in avoiding surgery and getting you back. And in some cases, um, division one or division two schools will cover it for athletes. Um, but otherwise, commercially and Medicare, it's not covered in general. Um, and we, we do not even try to submit it because I do run every year and double check with the insurances and find out that there's not coverage. But we can certainly give you a super bill to submit and try on your own. And you can use FSA and HSA and, and those types of things. You just want to check with them first because sometimes the policies are different. So you just want to make sure that your policy allows for it if you wanted to use like an FSA or an HSA card. In terms of cost, it can vary. And I, I, I was going to mention this and I forgot. So thank you for that question. Um, it can vary from $800 to $5,000 here in, in Tahoe. Um, you can go overseas and pay $30,000 to $45,000. Um, but so that's big range. But in general, 
Um, for a PRP, just give yourself a ballpark of a thousand to two thousand dollars, and for bone marrow, somewhere three thousand to four thousand dollars in Tahoe. <laughs> so, and I will say across the country, that's a because a, a, I know a lot of things in Tahoe are expensive. I'm very aware of that, and Barton really worked with me in terms of giving um, a very good price that is par. Um, across the country and one of the less expensive places to get it actually, which yay. <laughs> uh, there was a question if you have a practice in New York City. Uh, I used to have a practice in New Jersey um, and that's where I did most of my training in Philadelphia, New Jersey area and my patient population started there. Um, I have, but part of my, I also have a telemedicine practice that encompasses um, New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, uh, or, or Pennsylvania. Um, so I do offer um, virtual second opinions. So I, and it's primarily for this because there's a lot of people out there, unfortunately, that I talked about earlier. There's a lot of gimmicks. Um, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, financially motivated reasons to tell people to get certain things. And so I can be a very, um, uh, objective, um, and unbiased opinion when, you know, I'm giving a second opinion virtually, I'm not doing the procedure, um, and people can get a better idea of what is the best option for them. And that's a great option for people here in Tahoe too. There's a lot of, quite a few people who do um, what I do. Um, and then it gives people an unbiased opinion, so. Great, um, well, I'm not seeing any new questions. So I'll just fill in the gap in case anyone had any last questions. Um, just a reminder that this um, webinar has been recorded. You can find it on Barton's YouTube page, um, which is also where you registered. So if you scroll to the bottom, you can see the recording there. Um, and then there is a short survey we send out after every webinar just to get a good idea of how we did tonight and what future topics you'd like to hear. So we love that feedback and we do use that um, to determine future topics. Um, but I don't see any other questions. And I guess we'll give you guys back your 10 minutes on a Thursday night um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Dr. Katie, for being here. That was wonderful. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for joining, like Natasha said, on a Thursday, beautiful night. Hopefully I'll see you all at Lakeside Live and we'll listen to some music and go category. <laughs> Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.